Hello, hello everyone. Okay, something completely different in this video. Okay, just to give myself and yourselves a break from the uh, current news and so on. I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, I don't know whether you saw the previous videos, but uh, in one of them I remarked on the fact that I had been watching the inquiry from members of Parliament, in the British Parliament, as to the um, the uh, COVID inquiry and so on. And uh, the council there was uh, questioning uh, several members of the British government about the uh, lockdown and everything else, yes. And um, what I didn't mention was that I was watching the council or the, um, well, it wasn't a court of law, it was the, uh, the, uh, the um, interrogator, <laughs> um, the lawyer acting for for the for the for the people, and um, how different it was um, from other interrogations that we see in um, uh, you know in law courts or, for example, in the uh, American Congress when they bring witness to to um, speak to the uh, different committees and so on and they are normally questioned in in a rather antagonistic faction or for example journalists on television how they interview um, people or politicians and uh, they 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 are always sort of very antagonistic in most cases as to get to that gotcha moment and so on. And in this inquiry, I saw the old fashioned, um, the old fashioned way of questioning witnesses, which is not at all antagonistic. It's actually the, uh, the approach is even sympathetic to a certain extent. But of course, it is to get the witness to admit to something that they may not be willing to admit in the first place. So instead of punching, they are, as it were, sort of um, encircling the witness in a rather sympathetic fashion sometimes, you know, just to just to tell them, I, you know, I'm really on your side. I understand what you're saying. For example, in one of the, uh, I don't remember who they were uh, questioning, but there was an email with rather uh, vulgar language and so on and the um, the counsel I'm going to call it uh, call him the lawyer was saying uh, now this this email um, in this what some people consider might be rather vulgar language um, it was probably at the end of the day you were tired you were frustrated right and the witness said yes it was a very long day and you know sometimes you just write things and so so the the approach was sympathetic in order to draw the witness okay to 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 keep talking as it were and then i remember i found that fascinating how they can interrogate in this manner they have to be so well prepared they have to know all the facts they you know and i find it fascinating if i were 20 years old i think i would study law now instead of philosophy or politics because i find it fascinating and then i remembered a book that i read oh 25 years ago um about the art of uh, cross-examination of witnesses and I thought my goodness I remember reading that book and it was fascinating and I wonder whether I still have that book and I looked and looked and I finally found it and um, this is the book I think it has to be a classic because it's the art of cross-examination uh, by Francis L. Wellman. He's an American and he's talking about uh, cases in, in American uh, juris in the history of American ju jurisprudence and he's actually it's actually a book for law students 
and first of all he explains whether to do it this way or that way and the advantages and disadvantages of according to the witness and how to deal with that particular witness and then the rest of the book almost three quarters of it is about specific cases and he goes over the transcript of you know every question and every answer and then he gives his input as to you see here the lawyer missed an opportunity here he did it right here he did it wrong he could have done this and so on and i went back to the book and um, and i found some fascinating uh, examples of uh, very famous cases the book was written in 1903 1903 uh, so a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, examples are very old examples, but he went through very many editions. I think the last one was in the 1960s. And so the book was updated. And But um, I was going to read you, there are so many fascinating cases of how, how the lawyer is entrapping the, the witnesses to, you know, encircling them and so on. Uh, and I found one fascinating one, but it was too long. And I was going to read it to you because it's fascinating reading. And I was going to read it to you, but I, I decided against it because it's, it's, it was far too long. In Instead, I thought that I would read you. It's, it's, it's written very, very well in a sort of a normal language. Actually, well, no, the language is a little bit sort of 19th century, early 20th century uh, vocabulary, but it's easy to read. Um, and it is at the very beginning, he has already uh, explained how to cross-examine, for example, expert witnesses, you know, who come with all their expertise and how to get around that and so on. Um, so anyway, I look through the different chapters and I'm going to share with you one that I hope I hope you'll enjoy it is chapter four of the book and is cross examination of the perjured witness. And it says in the preceding chapters, it was attempted to offer a few suggestions gathered from experience for the proper handling of an honest witness who, through ignorance or partisanship, and more or less unintentionally, has testified to a mistaken state of facts injurious to our side of the litigation. In the present chapter, it is proposed to discuss the far more difficult task of exposing by the arts of cross-examination, the intentional fraud, the perjured witness. Here it is that the greatest ingenuity of the trial law lawyer is called into play. Here rules help but little as compared with years of actual experience. What can be conceived more difficult, more difficult in advocacy than the task of proving a witness whom you may neither have seen nor heard of before? He gives his testimony against you to be a willful perjurer, as it were out of his own mouth. It seldom happens that a witness's entire testimony is false from the beginning to the end. Perhaps the greater part of, of it is true, and only the crucial part, the point, however, on which the whole case may turn, is willfully false. If, at the end of his the direct testimony, we conclude that the witness we have to cross-examine to continue the imaginary trial we were conducted in the previous chapters comes un under this class, what means are we to employ to expose him to the jury? Let us first be certain we are right in our estimate of him that he intends perjury. 
Embarrassment is one of the emblems of perjury, but by no means always so. The novelty and difficulty of the situation, being called upon to testify before a room full of people, with lawyers on all sides ready to ridicule or abuse, often occasion embarrassment in witnesses of the highest integrity. Then again, some people are constitutionally nervous and could be nothing else when testifying in open court. Let us be sure our witness is not of this type before we subject him to the particular form of torture we have in store for the perjurer. Witnesses of a low grade of intelligence, when they testify falsely, usually display it in various ways. In the voice, in a certain vacant expression of the eyes, in a nervous twisting about in the witness chair, in an apparent effort to recall to mind the exact wording of their story, and especially in the use of language not suited to their station in life. On the other hand, there is something about the manner of an honest but ignorant witness that makes it at once manifest to an experienced lawyer that he is narrating only the things that he has actually seen and heard. The expression of the face changes with the narrative as he recalls the scene to his mind. He looks the examiner full in the face. His eyes brightens his eye brightens as he recalls to mind the various incidents. He uses gestures natural to a man in his station of life and suits them to the part of the story he is narrating, and he tells his tale in his own accustomed language. If, however, the manner of the witness and the wording of his testimony bear all the earmarks of fabrication, it is often useful, as your first question, to ask him to repeat his story. Usually he will repeat it in almost in almost, ident almost identically the same word as, words as before, showing he has learnt it by heart. Of course it is possible, though not probable, that he has done this and still is telling the truth. Try him by taking him to the middle of the story and from there jump him quickly to the beginning and then to the end of it. If he is speaking by rote rather than from recollection, he will be sure to succumb to, his, to this method. He has no facts with which to associate the wording of his story. He can only call it to mind as a whole and not in detachments. Draw his attention to other facts entirely disassociated with the main story as told by himself. He will be entirely unprepared for these new inquiries and will draw upon his imagination for answers. Distract his thoughts again to some new part of his main story and then suddenly, when his mind is upon another subject, return to those matters to which you had first called his attention and ask him the same questions a second time. He will again fall back upon his imagination imagination and very likely will give a different answer from the first and you have him in the net. He cannot invent answers as fast as you can invent questions and at the same time remember his previous inventions correctly. He will not keep his answers all consistent with one another. He will soon become confused and from that time on will be at your mercy. Let him go as soon as you have made it apparent that he is not mistaken, but is lying. An amusing account is given in the Green Bag for November 1891 of one Jeremiah Mason's cross-examinations of such a witness. Quote, the witness had previously testified to having heard Mason's client make a certain statement and it was upon the evidence of that statement that the adversary's case was based. Mr. Mason led the witness round to his statement and again it was repeated verbatim. 
Then, without warning, he walked to the stand and, pointing straight at the witness, said in his high, impassioned voice, Let's see that paper you've got in your waistcoat, po waistcoat pocket. Taken completely by surprise, the witness mechanically drew a paper from the pocket indicated and handed it to Mr. Mason. The lawyer slowly read the exact words of the witness in regard to the statement and called attention to the fact that they were in the handwriting of the lawyer on the other side. Mr. Mason, how under the sun did you know that that paper was there? asked a brother lawyer. Well, replied Mr. Mason, I thought he gave that part of his testimony just as if he had heard it, and I noticed every time he repeated it, he put his hand to his waist pocket, uh, waistcoat pocket and then let it fall again when he got through. Daniel Webster considered Mason the greatest lawyer that ever practiced at the New England bar. He said of him, quote, I would rather, after my own experience, meet all the lawyers I have ever known combined in a case than meet him alone and single-handed. Mason was always reputed to have possessed to a marked degree that instinct for the weak point in the witness he was cross-examining. In a recent celebrated criminal case, known as the Triangle Fire case, two proprietors of a lady's shirtwaist factory were indicted on a charge of manslaughter. 175 girls had lost their lives because a door of a loft in the factory was kept locked during working hours in violation of the factory law it was charged. Max D. Stauer, while conducting the defense, developed a most striking illustration of the value when the proper occasion arises of compelling a witness to repeat on cross-examination every detail of the story given on direct examination. This is especially so where the story had been extremely helpful to the side for which it was given and even calculated to create something of a sensation, but where a constant repetition of the story is up to disclose evidences of a carefully prepared recital rather than a spontaneous recollection of actual occurrences. It was an essential part of the people's case to prove that the girl, Rose Swartz, mention in the indictment was in fact the same person who lost her life in the fire. 100 witnesses had been sworn on behalf of the people. Many weeks had been consumed in hearing the testimony and not a word had been said about Rose Swartz, named in the indictment, excepting that her name had been casually mentioned as on the list of the employees. The testimony, on the contrary, had all been to the effect that the bodies that had been discovered in the building were so charred that identification was impossible. At the very close of the people's case, the court door was suddenly opened and one of the court attendants appeared with a very good-looking young woman who immediately attracted the attention of the jury on her way to the witness stand. The district attorney became very solemn. A harsh air of expectancy was created in the courtroom. The judge himself proceeded to swear the witness, although all the other witnesses had been sworn in the ordinary way by the clerk of the court. Having testified to many preliminary details, such as that the witness had been employed at the factory and was there when the fire broke out and that she knew Rose Watts, she was asked the question, Now tell me everything that you saw and did on the ninth floor of those premises from the time that the fire broke out. 
The witness then began to describe her first sight of the flames, how the girls scattered from one floor and ran to another, how many of them ran to the windows and began to jump out, how she herself had decided to follow their example. When she was at the window about ready to jump, she glanced around the room in a desperate effort to escape and looking at the Washington Street door that was supposed to have been locked, she saw Rose Watts with both hands on the knob of the door, desperately turning the knob in an attempt to open the door, both by pulling and pushing, but the door would not give. She stayed there transfixed watching Rose, and saw the flames envelop her hands, saw her fall to the floor, and then saw her once more struggle to her feet, again grab the knob of the door, and turn it one way and the other way, pulled and then pushed, but the door would not give. Once more the flames enveloped Rose and again she had to withdraw her hands from the doorknob and she fell to the floor. The flames were now coming very close to the witness. She turned once more to the Washington Street door and there, for the third time, was Rose Swartz on her knees, screaming and praying with both hands on the doorknob, turning it first one way, then the other, and pulling and pushing, but the door would not give. And finally she was completely enveloped by the flames and fell to the floor within a foot of the Washington Washington Street door. There was not a dry eye in the jury box when she closed her testimony. The first half hour, the first half hour of the cross examination was confined to preliminaries, during which the witness told how she was rescued, first taken to a hospital and then home, how she had been brought to the district attorney's office and had many interviews there with various assistants, how finally she had been moved to Philadelphia at the direction of the district attorney so that she should be beyond the approach of the defendants and was housed there at the expense of the people how she was visited there a number of times by representatives of the district attorney etc etc at the end of the half hour she was asked now you remember just where you were seated at the time when you first saw the sign of a fire? She answered, yes. And then, in the exact words in which uh, the district attorney had put his question, the question was repeated to her, asking her to state all she did herself and all that she saw done on the ninth floor from the moment on. From that moment on. She began her narrative with exactly the same word that she had used when telling her story the first time, and continued in precisely the same words that she had used to the district attorney in answering that question. Thereupon the subject was once more changed, and nearly a half hour was used in examination upon various matters relating to the fire. At the end of this second half hour, the question was for the third time put, and the witness started with the same word and continued to narrate the story in precisely the same words that she had used before, except that she omitted one word. She was asked whether it was not the fact that she had omitted a word, naming the word. Her lips began to move and start the narrative to herself all over again. And when she reached the position where that word belonged, she said, yes, I made a mistake. I left that word out. The counsel asked her, but otherwise your answer was correct. She again began to move her lips obviously reciting to herself that she had pre what she had previously said and then said, yes, otherwise my answer is correct. When the question was put to her for the third time, 
the district attorney vigorously objected, but was overruled. Another period of 20 minutes or more was used in, examina in examining her with relation to other matters, and then for the fourth time the question was put to her, Will you please tell the jury what you saw and what you did after you first observed any sign of the flames? She started with the same word and continued her narrative, but again left out one word, this time a different word. Asked whether she had now omitted a word, naming it, she went through the same lip performance and replied that she had, and upon being asked to place the word where it belonged, she proceeded to do so. There was no further examination of that witness. There were no more tears in the jury box. The situation had entirely changed. The witness had not hurt, but had very uh, materially helped the defence. She had succeeded in casting grave suspicion on the testimony of many of the girls who had previously testified. Her carefully prepared story had aroused the suspicion of the jury regarding the entire case of the prosecution. If perjured testimony in our courts were confined to the ignorant class, the work of cross-examining them would be a comparatively simple matter, but unfortunately for the cause of truth and justice, this is far from the case. Perjury is decidedly on the increase. And at the present time, in our local courts, scarcely a trial is conducted in which it does not appear in a more or less flagrant form. Nothing in the trial of a cause is so difficult as to expose the perjury of a witness whose intelligence assists him to hide his lack of scruples. There are various methods at attempting it, but no uniform rule can be laid down as to the proper manner to be employed towards such, such a witness. It all depends upon the individual character you have to unmask. In a large majority of cases, the chance of success will be greatly increased by not allowing the witness to see that you suspect him before you have led him to commit himself as to various matters with which you have reason to believe you can confront him later on. Two famous cross-examiners at the Irish bar were Sergeant Sullivan, afterwards Master of the Rolls in Ireland, and Sergeant Armstrong, two sergeants. Barry O'Brien, in his Life of Lord Russell, describes their methods. Sullivan, he says, approached the witness quite in a friendly way, seemed to be an impartial inquirer seeking information, looked surprised at what the witness said, appeared even grateful for the additional light thrown on the case. Ah, indeed. Well, as you have said so much, perhaps you can help us a little further. Well, really, my lord, this is a very intelligent man. So, playing the witness with caution and skill, drawing him stealthily on, keeping him completely in the dark about the real point of attack, the little surgeon, the first surgeon, waited until the man was in the meshes and then flew at him and shook him as a terrier would a rat. The other sergeant, the big sergeant, Armstrong, had more humour and more power, but less dexterity and resource. His great weapon was ridicule. He laughed at the witness and made everybody else laugh. The witness got confused and lost his temper, and then Armstrong pounded him like a champion in the ring. 
In some cases, it is wise to confine yourself to one or two salient points on which you feel confident you can get the witness to contradict himself out of his own mouth. It is seldom useful to press him on matters with which he is familiar. It is the safer course to question him on circumstances connected with his story, but to which he has not already testified and for which he would not be likely to prepare himself. A simple but perhaps instructive example of cross-examination conducted along these lines is quoted from Judge J. W. Donovan's Tact in Court. It is mainly interesting in that it is reported to have occurred in Abraham Lincoln's first defense at a murder trial. Quote, this is what uh, Judge Donovan says in the book. Grayson was charged with shooting Lockwood at a camp meeting on the evening of August 9th, 18 something, and with running away from the scene of the killing, which was witnessed by Sovine. That's the name of the witness. The proof was so strong that even with an excellent previous character, Grayson came very near being lynched on two occasions soon after his indictment for murder. The mother of the accused, after failing to secure older counsel, finally engaged young Abraham Lincoln, as he was then called, and the trial came on to an early hearing. No objection was made to the jury and no cross-examination of witnesses, save the last and only important one who swore that he knew the parties, saw the shot fired by Grayson, saw him run away and picked up the deceased who died instantly. The evidence of guilt and identity was morally certain. The attendance was large the interest intense, Grayson's mother began to wonder why Abraham remained silent so long and why he didn't do something. The people finally rested. The tall lawyer, Lincoln, stood up and eyed the strong witness in silence, without books or notes, and slowly began his defense by these questions. Lincoln, and you were with Lockwood just before and saw the shooting? Witness, yes. And you stood very near to them? No, about 20 feet away. May it not have been 10 feet? No, it was 20 feet or more. In the open field? No, in the timber. What kind of timber? Beech timber. Leaves on it are rather thick in August. Rather. And you think this pistol was the one used? It looks like it. You could see defendant shoot, see how the barrel hung and all about it? Yes. How near was this to the meeting place? three quarters of a mile away. Where were the lights? Up by the minister's stand. Three quarters of a mile away? Yes. Did you not see a candle there with Lockwood or Grayson? No. What would we want a candle for? How then did you see the shooting? By moonlight. You saw this shooting at 10 at night in beech timber, three quarters of a mile from the light, saw the pistol barrel, saw the man fire, saw it 20 feet away, saw it all by moonlight, saw it nearly a mile from the camp lights. Yes, I told you so before. 
the interest was now so intense that men leaned forward to catch the smallest syllable. Then the lawyer drew out a blue-covered almanac from his side coat pocket, opened it slowly, offered it in evidence, showed it to the jury and the court, read from a page with careful deliberation that the moon on that night was unseen and only arose at one the next morning. Following this climax, Mr. Lincoln moved the arrest of the perjured witness as the real murderer, saying, Nothing but a motive to clear himself could have induced him to swear away so falsely the life of one who never did him harm. With such determined emphasis did Lincoln present his showing that, that the court ordered uh, Sovin arrested and under the strain of excitement he broke down and confessed to being the one who fired the fatal shot himself but denied it was intentional. The author of the book, Francis Wellman, says he has been quoting from this other book by a judge. And then he says, I have quoted this occurrence verbatim as given by Judge Donovan. It affords a most striking illustration of the fallacies of testimony. The occasion on which Lincoln acquitted his clients of a charge of murder by com confronting an eyewitness with an almanac to refute the testimony given by the light of the moon, instead of being the first criminal case tried by young Abraham Lincoln, was in reality one of the last and most important criminal cases he ever tried. The defendant's name, instead of being Grayson, was William Armstrong, who was tried August 29, 1857, for the killing of one James Metzer, not Lockwood. And it was upon this occasion that Lincoln's talent as a trial, uh, talents as a trial lawyer saved the day for his client. The story of this now famous case has often been recounted and the distortions wrought by many versions of it through many mouths and during many years might well take a prominent place in the discussion of the unreliability of honest testimony dealt with at some length in a subsequent chapter. Frederick Trevor Hill in his Lincoln, the lawyer, has given a complete retelling of the facts gathered directly from the records themselves and from the lawyer who was associated with Lincoln in the trial and who was still living in Mason County at the time Mr. Hill wrote his book. It appears that Lincoln, when working in a New Salem store, had won the respect and admiration of the rough element in that community by flooring one Jack Armstrong, the leader of a gang of boys, in a wrestling match, and the fallen champion instantly became his staunch friend and ally. Armstrong afterwards married, and Lincoln, who knew his wife, could not resist her appeal when she sought, uh, sought him uh, sought him out during the great debate with Douglas and begged him to come to the rescue of her son, who was charged with murder and about to be tried. Lincoln laid aside his pressing political engagements and plunged at once into the trial of the case. Popular indignation against Armstrong had become so violent in Mason County that his lawyers had obtained a change of venue upon the ground that a fair trial could not be had in the local courts. Mr. Hill goes on to say that not only were the facts against Lincoln, Lincoln's client, but the Illinois law of that day did not permit a defender to testify in his own behalf and Armstrong had no opportunity to deny the testimony of the accusing witnesses. 
As most of the witnesses were young, Lincoln attempted to secure a jury of young men of the average age of not over 25 and succeeded in handling the government's witnesses all of about the same age so skillfully on cross-examination that their testimony had but little weight against the accused. Almost all of them were from the neighborhood of New Salem, and when Lincoln heard a familiar name, he quickly took advantage of the opening to let the witness know he was familiar with his home, knew his family, and wished to be his friend. These tactics succeeded so well that no very damaging testimony was elicited until a man by the name of Allen, not Sovine, uh, as Judge Donovan Hesset took the stand. According to Mr. Hill, this witness swore that he actually saw the defendant strike the fatal blow with a slung shot or some such weapon, not a pistol, and Lincoln, pressing him closely, forced him to locate the hour of the assault as about 11 at night and then demanded that he inform the jury how he managed to see so clearly at that time of night. By the moonlight, answered the witness promptly. Well, was there light enough to see everything that happened? persisted the examiner. The witness responded that the moon was about in the same place that the sun would be at 10 o'clock in the morning and was almost full, and the moment the words were out of his mouth, the cross-examiner confronted him with a calendar showing that the moon afforded practically no light at 11 o'clock and had absolutely set at seven, uh, and had absolutely set at seven minutes after midnight. This was the turning point in the case, and from that moment, Lincoln carried everything before him. The comparison of these two accounts of a very simple and familiar method of cross-examiners serves as a most striking illustration of the fallibilities of testimony. For the details of the Armstrong case have been gossip at, at the Illinois bar almost to the present day, and the original story as given by Mr. Hill has evidently gradually reached the form in which it is given by Judge Donovan. The main fe feature of the examination was the same, the use of the calendar, but the names of the defendant and of the witness and all the details of the occurrence both before and after the trial are entirely different. It has even been frequently stated by members of the Illinois Bar that Lincoln actually played a trick on the jury in this case by substituting an old calendar for the one of the year of the murder and virtually manufactured the testimony which carried the day. This rumor has been repeatedly exposed, but I am told it still persists on the Illinois circuit to this day. In speaking of Lincoln's as a cross-examiner, Mr. Hill points out that as there, are, there were no court stenographers during the 23 years that Lincoln practiced at the bar, it is impossible to secure a verbatim report of the questions and answers in Lincoln's cases, illustrative of his methods of handling witnesses, but says that he was conceded by all his contemporaries that as a cross-examiner he had no equal at the bar, and woe betide the unlucky individual who suppressed the truth or coloured it. More than one man has described the effect of Lincoln's eyes by saying that they appeared to look directly through whatever he concentrated his gaze upon. Incidentally, as Lincoln's biographers have devoted their attention almost entirely to his political career rather than to his career as a lawyer, it is interesting to note that in his 23 years at the bar, he had no less than 172 cases 
before the highest courts of Illinois, a record said to be unsurpassed by any of his contemporaries, and tried more cases than any other member of his local bar, being the attorney for the Illinois Central Railroad, the greatest corporation in the state at the time, as well as the as for the Rock Island Railroad and many other important corporations and individuals. He was a stickler for legal ethics, adopting the maxim, better to make a life than a living. And on several occasions where he felt he was wrong, while he did not actually abandon the case, he ceased to cooperate with his associate counsel. You speak to the jury, he once said to Leonard Sweat, his associate counsel. If I say a word, they will see from my face that the man is guilty and convict him. And Mr. Hill tells of another occasion when, as it developed that, that uh, Lincoln's client had indulged in fraudulent practices, he walked out of the courtroom and refused to continue the case. The judge sent a messenger directing him to return, but he positively declined. Quote, Tell the judge that my hands are dirty and I have gone away to wash them, was his disgusted response. A difficult but extremely effective method of exposing a certain kind of perjurer is to lead him gradually to a point in his story where, in his answer to the final question, which? he will have to choose either one or the other of the only two explanations left to him, either of which would degrade, if not entirely discredit him, in the eyes of the jury. The writer, this is the, the author himself, Francis Wellman, uh, once heard the Honorable Joseph H. Coity make very telling use of this method of examination. A stockbroker was being sued by a married woman for the return of certain bonds and securities in the broker's possession, which she alleged belonged to her. Her husband took the witness stand and swore that he had deposited the securities with the stockbroker as collateral against his own market speculations, but that they did not belong to him and that he was acting for himself and not as agent for his wife and had taken her securities unknown to her. It was the contention of Mr. Coetie that even if the bonds belonged to the wife, she had either consented to her husband's use of the bonds or else was a partner with him in the transaction. Both of these contentions were denied under oath by the husband. Mr. Coetie, the lawyer, when you ventured into the realm of speculations in Wall Street, I presume you contemplated the possibility of the market going against you, did you not? Witness, well, no, Mr. Coetti, I went into Wall Street to make money, not to lose it. Quite so, sir, but you will admit, will you not, that sometimes the stock market goes contrary to expectations. Well, yes, I suppose it does. You say the bonds were not your own property, but your wife's. Yes, sir. And you say that she did not lend them to you for purposes of speculation or even know you had possession of them. Yes, sir. You even admit that when you deposited the bonds with your broker as collateral against your stock speculations, you did not acquaint him with the fact that they were not your own property. I did not mention whose property they were, sir. Well, sir, in the event of the market going against you and your collateral being sold to meet your losses, whom did you intend to cheat? Your broker or your wife? <laughs> Dun, 
the witness could give no satisfactory answer, and for once a New York jury was found willing to give a verdict against the customer and in favor of a Wall, Wall Street broker. In the great majority of cases, however, the most skillful efforts of the cross-examiner will fail to lead the witness into such traps as these. If you have accomplished one such coup, be content with the point you have made. Do not try to make another with the same witness. Sit down and let the witness leave the stand. Remind yourself of Josh Willing's advice. When you strike, I'll stop boring. Many a man has bored clean through and let the aisle run out of the bottom. I don't quite understand what this means. It might, being American, it must be something to do with sports. Anyway, a very prominent lawyer whose testimony, if accepted by the jury, would have ended an important litigation, was entirely discredited by a resourceful, watchful, young Hebrew lawyer evidently having heard of the witness's desire to conceal the race of his birth, who saw his chance and pushed it to a victory with his first few questions. And this is the lawyer. What is your name, Mr. Witness? My name is Mr. Wiles. Yes, I know your last name. But what is your full name? S. Coleman Wiles. Yes, so you said. But what does the S stand for, Mr. Wiles? I never use it. I am always addressed as Coleman Wiles. Well, you have an S in your name. What does it stand for? I tell you, I never use it. Judge, will you please tell the witness to answer my question? Judge, certainly. Mr. Wiles, you will have to answer the question. Witness, S stands for Solomon. Counsel, in great surprise. Why, Mr. Wiles? Was you ashamed of the name? <laughs> and no Jew in the jury box had any further use for either the witness or his testimony. But let us suppose you are examining a witness with whom no such climax is, climax is possible. Here you will require infinite patience and industry. Try to show that his story is inconsistent with itself or with other known facts in the case or with the ordinary experience of mankind. There is a wonderful power in persistence. If you fail in one quarter, abandon it and try something else. There is surely a weak spot somewhere if the story is perjured. Frame your questions skillfully. Ask them if you wanted a certain answer. N Sorry. Ask them as if you wanted a certain answer when in reality you desire just the opposite one. Hold your own temper while you lead the witness to lose his. It's a golden rule on all such occasions. If you allow the witness a chance to give his reasons or explanations, you may be sure that they will be damaging to you, not to him. If you can succeed in tiring out the witness or in driving him to the point of sullenness, you have produced the effect of lying. However, it is not intended to advocate the practice of lengthy cross-examinations because their effect, unless the witness is broken down, is to lead the jury to exaggerate the importance of evidence given by a witness who requires so much cross-examination in the attempt to upset him. 
During the Tickborn trial for perjury, a remarkable man named Louis was called to testify. He was a shrewd witness and told his tale with wonderful precision and apparent accuracy. That he was untrue, there could hardly be a question, but that he could be proved untrue was extremely doubtful and an almost hopeless task. It was an improbable story, but still was not an absolutely impossible one. If true, however, the claimant was the veritable Roger Tickbourne, or at least the probabilities would be so immensely in favour of that supposition that no jury would agree in finding that he was Arthur Orton. His manner of uh, giving his evidence was perfect. After the trial, one of the jurors was asked what he thought of Louis' evidence and if he ever attached any importance to his story. He replied that at the close of the evidence-in-chief he thought it so improbable that no credence could be given to it. But, quote, but after Mr. Hawkins had, had been at him for a day and could not shake him, I began to think, if such a cross-examiner as that cannot touch him, there must be something in what he says, and I began to waver. I could not understand how it was that, if it was all lies, it did not break down under such able counsel. The presiding judge whose slightest word is weightier than the eloquence of counsel, will often interrupt an aimless and prolonged cross-examination with an abrupt, Mr. I think you are wasting time, or I shall not allow you to pursue that subject further, or I cannot see the object of this examination. This is a setback from which only the most experienced advocate can readily recover. Before the judge spoke, the jury, perhaps, were already a little tired and inattentive and anxious to finish the case. They were just in the mood to agree with the remark of his honour and the atmosphere of the case, as I have always termed it, was fast becoming unfavourable to the delinquent attorney's client. How important a part in the final outcome of every trial this atmosphere of the case usually plays. Many jurymen lose sight of the parties to the litigation, our clients, in their absorption over the conflict of wits going on between their respective lawyers. It is in criminal prosecutions where local politics are involved that the jury system is perhaps put to its severest test. The ordinary juryman is so apt to be blinded by his political prejudices that where the guilt or innocence of the prisoner at the bar turns upon the question as to whether the prisoner did or did not perform some act, involving a supposed advantage to his political party, the jury is up to be, to be divided upon political lines. Some time ago, when a wave of political reform was sweeping over New York City, the good government clubs caused the arrest of about 50 inspectors of election for violations of the election laws. These men were all brought up for trial in the Supreme Court criminal term before Mr. Justice Barrett. The prisoners were to be defended by various leading trial lawyers and everything depended upon the result of the first few cases tried. If these trials resulted in acquittals, it was anticipated that there would be acquittals all along the line. If the first offenders put on trial were convicted and sentenced to severe terms in prison, the great majority of the others would plead guilty and few would escape. All of these cases were assigned to me to prosecute, to the author of the book. At that time, the county of New York was divided for purposes of voting, 
into 1,067 election districts, and on an average, perhaps 250 votes were cast in each district. An inspector of one of the election districts was the first man called for trial. The charge against him was the failure to record correctly the vote cast in his district for the Republican candidate for Alderman. In this particular election district, there had been 167 ballots cast, and it was the duty of the inspectors to count them and return the result of their count to police headquarters. At the trial, 12 respectable citizens took the witness chair one after another and affirmed that they lived in the, pris in the prisoner's elect election district and had all cast their ballots on election day for the Republican candidate. The official count for the district signed by the prisoner was then put in evidence which read Democratic votes, 167. Republican votes, zero. There were a number of witnesses called by the defense who were Democrats. The case began to take on a political aspect, which was likely to result in a divided jury and no conviction, since it had been so shown that the prisoner had a most excellent reputation and had never been su suspected of wrongdoing before. Finally, the prisoner himself was sworn in, in, uh, sworn in his own behalf. The object of my cross-examination was to leave the witness in such a position before the jury that no matter what their politics might be, they could not avoid convicting him. There were but five questions added. Counsel, you have told us, sir, that you have a wife and seven children depending upon you for support. I presume you desire, your desire is not to be obliged to leave them, is it not? Prisoner, most assuredly, sir. Apart from that consideration, I presume you have no particular desire to spend a term of years in Sing Sing prison. Certainly not, sir. Well, you have heard twelve respectable citizens take the witness stand and swear they voted the Republican ticket in your district, have you not? Yes, sir. Pointing to the jury, the counsel. And you see these twelve respectable gentlemen sitting here, ready to pass judgment upon the question of your liberty, do you not? I do, sir. Well now, Mr. S., you will please explain to these twelve gentlemen, pointing to the jury, how it was that the ballots ballots cast by the other 12 gentlemen were not counted by you and then you can take your hat and walk right out of the courtroom a free man. The witness hesitated, cast down his eyes but made no answer and counsel sat down. Of course, a conviction followed. The prisoner was sentenced to five years in state prison. During the following few days, nearly 30 defendants indicted for, indicted for similar offences pleaded guilty, and the entire work of the court was completed within a few weeks. There was not a single acquittal or disagreement. Occasionally, when sufficient knowledge of facts about the witness or about the details of the direct testimony can be correctly anticipated, a trap may be set into which 
even a clever witness, as in the illustration that follows, will be likely to fall. During the lifetime of Dr. J. W. Ramney, there were few physicians in this country who were so frequently seen on the witness stand as he, especially in damage suits. So expert a witness had he become that Chief Justice Van Brunt many years ago told me that any lawyer who attempts to cross-examine Dr. Ramney is a fool. A case occurred in my practice a few years before Dr. Ramney died, however, where a failure to cross-examine would have been tantamount to a confession of judgment, and, though fully aware of the dangers, I was left no alternative, and, as so often happens, where fools rush in, I made one of those lucky bull's eyes that is perhaps worth recording. It was a damage case brought against the city by a lady who, on her way from church one spring morning, had tripped over an obscure encumbrance in the street, and had, in consequence, been practically bedridden for the three years leading up to the day of the trial. She was brought into the courtroom in a chair and was placed in front of the jury, a pallid, pitiable object surrounded by her women friends, who acted upon this occasion as nurses, constantly bathing her hands and face with ill-smelling ointments and administering restoratives with marked effect upon the jury. Her counsel, ex-Chief Justice Noah Davis, claimed that her spine had been permanently injured and asked the jury for $50,000 in damages. Those were the days. It appeared that Dr. Ramney had been in constant attendance upon the patient ever since the day of her accident. He testified that he had visited her, visit her some 300 times and had examined her minutely at least 200 times in order to make up his mind as to the absolutely correct diagnosis of her case, which he was now thoroughly satisfied was one of genuine disease of the spinal marrow itself. Judge Davis asked him a few preliminary questions and then gave the doctor his head and bade him turn to the jury and tell them all about it. Dr. Ramney spoke uninterruptedly for nearly three quarters of an hour. He described in detail the sufferings of his patient since she had been under his care, his efforts to relieve her pain, the hopeless nature of her malady. He then proceeded in a most impressive way to picture to the jury the gradual and relentless progress of the disease as it assumed the form of creeping paralysis, involving the destruction of one organ after another until death became a blessed relief. At the close of this recital, without a question more, Judge Davis turned to me and said in a calm but triumphant tone. Do you wish to cross-examine? Now, the one point in dispute, there was no defense on the merits, was the nature of the patient's malady. The city's medical witnesses were unanimous that the lady had not and could not have contracted spinal disease from the slight injury she had received. They styled her complaint as hysterical, existing in the patient's mind alone, and not indicating nor involving a single diseased organ. But the jury evidently all believed Dr. Ramney and were anxious to render a verdict on his testimony. He must be cross-examined. Absolute failure could be no worse than silence though it was evident that, along expected lines, question re questions relating to his direct evidence would be worse than useless. 
Council was well aware of the doctor's reputed fertility of resource and quickly decided upon his tactics. My first questions emphasized to the jury the fact that the witness had been the medical expert for the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad, 35 years, for the New York Central Railroad, 40 years, for the New York and Harlem River Railroad, 20 years, for the Erie Railroad, 15 years, and so on, until the doctor was forced to admit that he was so much in court as a witness in defense of these various railroads as was and was so occupied with their affairs that he had but comparatively little time to devote to his reading and private practice. Here goes the uh, cross-examination. Counsel, are you able to give us, doctor, the name of any medical authority that agrees with you when you say that the particular group of symptoms existing in this case points to one disease and one only? Dr. Oh, yes, Dr. Erickson agrees with me. Who is Dr. Erickson, if you please? Well, Mr. Wellman, Erickson was probably one of the most famous surgeons that England has ever produced. There was a little laughter in the audience. What book has he written? Doctor, smiling, he has written a book called Erickson on the Spine which is altogether the best known work on the subject. And there was more laughter. Counsel, when was this book published? About 10 years ago. Well, how is it that a man whose time is so much occupied, as you have told us, as, as yours is, has leisure enough to look up medical authorities to see if they agree with him. The doctor, fairly beaming on counsel, said, Well, Mr. Wellman, to tell you the truth, I have often heard of you, and I have suspected that you would ask me such some such foolish question. So this morning, after my breakfast and before starting for court, I took down from my library my copy of Erickson's book and found that he agreed entirely with my diagnosis in this case. And there was more laughter in which the jury joined. Counsel, reaching under the counsel's table and taking up his own copy of Erickson's Erickson on the spine and walking deliberately up to the witness said, showing him the book, won't you be good enough to point out to me where Erickson adopts your view on this case? Doctor embarrassed. Oh, I, I can't do it now. It is a very thick book. Still holding the book, the counsel says, But you forget, doctor, that thinking I might ask you uh, some such foolish question, you examine your volume of Erickson this very morning after breakfast and before coming to court. The doctor, becoming more embarrassed and still refusing to take the book, says, I have no time to do it now. Time? Why, there is all the time in the world. No answer from the doctor. Counsel and witness eye each other closely. And the counsel sitting down, still eyeing witness. I am sure the court will allow me to suspend my examination until you shall have had time to turn to the place you read this you read this morning in that book and can reread it now aloud to the jury. No answer. The courtroom was in deathly silence for fully three minutes. The witness uh, wouldn't say anything. Counsel for the plaintiff didn't dare say anything. 
and counsel for the city didn't want to say anything. He saw that he had caught the witness in a manifest falsehood and that the doctor's whole testimony was discredited with the jury unless he could open to the paragraph referred to which counsel well knew did not exist in the whole work of Ericsson. At the expiration of a few minutes, Mr. Just, Mr. Justice Barrett, who was presiding at the trial, turned quietly to the witness and asked him if he desired to answer the question, and upon his replying that he did not intend to answer it any further than he had already done, he was excused from the witness stand amid almost breathless silence in the courtroom. As he passed from the witness chair to his seat, he stopped and whispered into my ear, You are the est most impertinent man I have ever met. After a ten days trial, the jury were unable to forget the collapse of the plaintiff's principal witness and failed to agree upon a verdict. Every now and then it falls to the lot of every trial lawyer to experience one of those rare thrills that pay for many years of patient plodding. Especially is, uh, is this the case when he succeeds in unmasking an overprepared or overschooled witness giving testimony, though partly true, yet in its essential features, usually false. The Inno, Inno Will case, tried in our surrogate's court within the last year, Max D. Stauer, appearing for the contestants, afforded some interesting illustrations of the injury it is possible to do a case by calling an overprepared or overcoached witness at a critical part of the trial and subjecting such witness to the wiles of a skillful cross-examiner. Columbia University had been made the residuary legatee in the will of Amos R. Inno. The will was contested by Mr. Inno's two nephews. The claim of the contestants was that was that the testator hated universities in general and Columbia University and its president in particular. There was the further claim that he was very fond of two of his nephews and that they had been discriminated against in the will. The proponents, on the other hand, in answer, sought to show that the testator had a great contempt for these nephews and that he was a great believer in educational institutions in general and Columbia University in particular. They reserved for their last witness a most engaging lady of gentle manners and facility of speech who really summed up the whole case for the proponents. In order to show that the testator favoured universities in general, and Columbia in particular, she recalled three conversations. On one of these occasions, she met the testator who asked her to take a walk with him. As she told it, it seemed to her particularly pathetic because he said, Won't you walk with the blind old man? And of course she did and they happened to be in the vicinity of the University of the City of New York, which also became one of the legatees under the will. They walked by the university and she asked the testator whether he had seen the university's new building and he replied in the negative, but he was glad that this present building was still in the vicinity and then he said to her, this university and Columbia College are soon going to be the Cambridge and Oxford of the United States and spoke of both universities in terms of the highest praise. On another occasion, the testator happened to call at her home and said, I noticed that your friend, 
naming him, died and that he left a will naming Yale University as the residuary legatee. The testator proceeded to praise this will. He hardly knew the friend that died, but said that he must have been a wonderful man in order to make a will of that kind, and extolled men who left their money to universities. Of course, the will that the friend left was in court, ready to be produced, and Yale University was made the residuary legatee in it, right enough. The witness recalled a third conversation in which the testator, in the presence also of the mother of this witness, lamented the fact that he was without people who were near and dear to him, and told the mother how fortunate she was to have such a devoted daughter, and pointed to his own situation as being a most unfortunate one, because none of his relatives paid the slightest attention to him. And the mother said, but you have a sister and brother and nephews, and made particular reference to his nephews. He spoke slightingly of his brother and sister in reply to the question, was not one of your nephews named for you? He answered, yes, but the trouble is that he thinks that I was named for him. Thus, the witness proceeded to overthrow the whole theory of the contestants that the testator hated universities and that he had a strong affection for his nephews. The cross-examination of Mr. Stower soon developed the inconsistencies of these alleged conversations. It was shown that the testator had made four wills after his alleged conversation when the witness swore. Mr. Reno had stated that Columbia and the University of the City of New York would be the Oxford and Cambridge of the United States and had failed to mention either of these institutions in any of those four wills. Another difficulty with her alleged conversation was that after this friend of the family had died and named Yale University as the residuary legatee, Mr. Inno had made five wills, in none of which had he mentioned any university, either Columbia or any other. And yet in each he had disposed of a large residuary estate. And lastly, there was no nephew that was named for the testator, and the testator could never have been under any impression that there was a nephew that had been named for him unless his mind had become weak, and the very claim of the contestants was that the mind of the testator had become weak, so that the proponents had the choice of two evils. If the testator thought that he had a nephew that was named after him, he did not argue well for the proponents. If the testator did not think that he had a nephew named after him, he did not argue well for the veracity of the witness. The point was that while the summation through this witness was well prepared so as to influence the jury, it was not carefully prepared in view of the facts that were readily brought to light. The testator being dead, and the mother of the witness also being dead, her story stood without contradiction, yet the facts which it covered were so inherently improbable, and it was so apparent that this witness had been called last as a sort of climax in the case that instead of helping the proponents it proved a great detriment and her cross-examination by Mr. Stower was of the utmost value. In this case there was a further illustration of a practically similar situation. It should be borne in mind that the ground of the contest was that the testator was incompetent, incompetent to make the will in question. 
A lawyer was called by the proponent who testified that on the very day when the will was executed, entirely by accident, he met the testator on a train going from New York to Saratoga, that in the smoker he also accidentally happened to sit next to the testator. He conversed with the testator in the smoking car all the way from New York to Albany. The conversations covered a great variety of subjects. The testator displayed a wonderful memory, a remarkable grasp of present-day situations and of all questions that were then current. He advised this lawyer with respect to invest he advised this lawyer with respect to investments, discussed with him decisions made by appellate courts, and clearly gave evidence of a mind in healthy condition. This conversation, of course, could not be contradicted. There was nobody alive other than this attorney who participated therein. The witness had a chair in the parlor car, had left his bag and other articles in the parlor car and then had taken a seat in the smoker. The witness saw the deceased leaving the train at Albany where they had to change cars. He saw nobody assist the deceased from the train and the deceased got off in the same manner that other passengers did and there was nothing unusual about his walk or gait so that not only was the decedent in good mental condition but he was in fine physical condition. Here again Mr. Stoyer's cross-examination exposed either the faulty memory or the perjury of the witness, although the witness could not be directly contradicted in his conversation with the deceased man. First, there was no parlor car on that train. The jury evidently found it very difficult for a man to leave his bag and things in the parlor car when there was no parlor car to leave them in. Second, the disease never smoked and detested the odor of smoke. It annoyed, it annoyed him so much that while he was a great entertainer and gave numerous large dinner parties at his home, on each occasion when it came time for lighting cigars, he withdrew from the men until the smoking period was over. At his country residence, when the cigars were passed, he would go out on his porch and sit apart from the other guests so as not to be molested by the smoke. The day on which this trip was taken from New York to Saratoga was a very hot day, everybody agreed. The jury could not well reconcile the prior aversion of the deceased toward smoke with his affection for it on that particular day. All the witnesses on both sides had agreed that at that particular time the disease was feeble. He had not been for years without an attendant. It was admitted that the attendant was with the deceased on his journey from New York to Saratoga. The witness had seen no attendant. Everybody except this witness agreed that the decedent had great difficulty in seeing steps and that in passing from the curve he used his cane to tap in order to gorge the distance that he would have to step down and that his attendants always assisted him. The train step at Albany was rather high. The jury, knowing that the attendant was on the train, and the testimony all being to the effect that the man required assistance in going up or downstairs, found it difficult to reconcile the previous conduct of the disease for a number of years with his supposed ability on that particular day when he signed his will and when he stepped from the train at Albany. Okay, this is, uh, has been a very uh, rather long, but uh, there you go. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it, or part of it at any rate. Bye-bye. See you soon.